What is up everybody? Welcome to Muddy Beards 4x4. Today is part two of how to build yourself the ultimate Dana... F I was about to say Dana 44, but it's a Dana 30. How to build yourself an ultimate Dana 30. You might be wondering why there's no part one here on Muddy Beards because it's on my buddy Nate's channel. Dirt Lifestyle, I will leave a link in the description to that video where they install this Arctec truss, sway bars, uh, outer C, all the bracing. The whole axle has been stripped down bare and everything on here is brand new and it looks really great. This thing is super beefy, never going to have any problems with it at all. So part two is going to be me installing the gears and the locker, which is going to be 488 gears, Yukon, and a Yukon zip locker, which is going to require a little more time and effort since we have to drill the housing uh, for the airline to go through. It's just a little bit more work, a little bit more difficult to do than a typical uh, gear setup. So in my opinion, Dana 30s are an absolute fantastic platform. I had one in my Jeep for a long time. This is a high pinion Dana 44 out of uh, an XJ. Cherokee, I believe, which I had in mine as well, and I never broke that thing. I had a locker in there and factory shafts, and then I had chromoly shafts. I never broke any of them, and I had 36 uh, IROX on there, and I beat it up pretty good, and I never had any problems with my Dana 30. So Dana 30 is a great option to build this up like this. You don't have to go as extreme, because this is pretty much as extreme as you can go with a Dana 30. Literally everything is upgraded as beefy, as big, as strong as it can actually be. As you can see, this little tiny pinion. But for some reason, man, these things are just built well and they just hold up. I don't understand why, but they just do. I've broken more Dana 44 stuff than I have Dana 30 stuff. Let's just say that. As long as you're not going to like 40 inch tires, 42s, going crazy. If you're running 35s like Matt's going to be doing, 35s, and he's just going to wheel it, he's going to drive it, and he's never going to have any problems with this. Okay, so here's some of the tools that you will need. This is not an all-inclusive list. Uh, this is just the main stuff that I can think of right now. You're going to need a bearing puller kit. This is one I got on eBay. It's like 280 bucks. I love this thing. I use this thing all the time. It's one of my favorite tools. Um, obviously sockets, soft face hammers, really super important. Good sets of sockets. Um, your bearing race installer kit, also good for seals. Your dial indicator so you measure your backlash. Uh, your preload, an inch pound torque wrench that measures the preload on your on your uh, pinion. And also your micrometer. Your micrometer right here, this is super important for measuring your shims. Obviously pry bars and your regular hammers. This is my favorite hammer. I love this thing. Uh, torque wrench, seal pullers. Uh, punches for getting the races out of the housing, brass drifts, your uh, impact wrenches. Like I said, this is not an all-inclusive list. There's going to be some other tools that I use, but these are the main ones. Also, shot press. You have to have one of those. These are the main big ones that you pretty much have to have in order to set up gears. And in this case, we also need our quarter-inch uh, tap and 716 drill bit since we are putting in an air locker and we have to drill the housing out. So although the instructions here say that we might need to ream our locker holes out here, flange holes to 7 16 that's actually not the case. They've actually gone and updated these and their holes are already 7 16 So in our case, our ringer bolts is 3 8 which is these little guys right here. So now we have a problem 
as our flange holes in our locker are way too big and it just kind of flops around in there. So those are going to come loose and you're going to have your ring gear is going to slop around on this locker and probably going to break. So in order to alleviate that, Yukon has a part here that's basically a spacer that goes over the, uh, the ring gear bolt right here and shims it out to 7 16 so it doesn't flop around. We have to install these and we're going to lock tighter bolts with our new ring gear bolts and uh, torque them down. Now that I got it set up in my vise, we will torque these down to 55 foot pounds. I'm gonna go around one more time, making sure they're all torqued. And that you don't miss any. When you're tearing down, it's super important that you mark these caps, the bearing caps, because they only go one way. And you can't mix and match them up. I usually use a punch and mark one dot, one dot, two dots, two dots on it so I can't mix it up. Luckily this was already marked two different times so I know which way they go. Your oil slinger. So that's going to sling oil up into the top of the housing and it's going to drop it down into that rear pinion bearing. And then there's going to be another piece right here. This guy, this is a new one that actually retains the oil in it. So the oil slinger slings it up through the top of the housing, there's a passage there, and it drops it right on top of this bearing, and then this actually keeps that oil in there for enough time that it stays lubricated, it doesn't just drain right, fall right back out. That goes on here, like this. There, you go. there we go. Okay, so I'm gonna take this over to the press and press it on. You can see I have this second race set up underneath here so it doesn't destroy my cage and squish it as I press on it. There we go, you can see how that, on the inside, press on it so it doesn't destroy my cage. Okay, so there's gonna be some slight differences with the zip locker. One being it comes with its own carrier bearings which are different than what's in the rebuild kit. You can see the profile is a little bit thinner on the, uh, the zip locker one. So let's press these bearings on the carrier. And like before, I'm using an inner race that I cut the, uh, the cage off in order to press this on so I don't mess with the cage because you don't want to just press flat onto it. This side, because the seal housing goes right here, it's actually gonna stick up a bunch and you're gonna need, you're gonna have to have a bearing race or something, a pipe that's gonna go over top of this without messing it up. Because this surface right here is real important to not mess up because that's where your O-rings ride and creates your seal for the air. We are just gonna use all the factory stuff except for this oil slinger and this bearing. There are shims here, so this is our bearing preload. So these bearings are going to ride like this inside that housing. So when you tighten down, oh crap, I don't have the pinion yoke. Oh, you know what? I actually have one right here. Boom. I just realized that they forgot the pinion yoke. I think this is a Dana 30 right here. Boom. I literally have one sitting on my workbench right there. Lucky me. Okay, so. This is gonna go like this, well, this is gonna go here, this is gonna go here, and then obviously you're nut, right? So as you tighten this down, these two bearings are gonna squish. This is gonna slide all the way in, and it's gonna squish into the races. So the less shims you have, 
the tighter it can get into the races, it kind of squishes into the races, the tighter it'll get. So if your pinion bearing preload is too tight, you want to add shims. All right, so the race is in here, and as it tightens it in the housing, the more shims you put in here, the farther out of this race it puts it. So it makes it looser. So you can tighten on it as long as you want, tight, 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 and it won't get any tighter. The preload will not get any tighter because of these shims. So if it's too tight, add like 0 .005 of a shim, tiny little guy, move it out, check it then. If it's too loose, you're going to want to take away shims and tighten it up. There's different types of pinion nuts, and all of them have basically a locking ring, a swedge up at the top of it here. So if you look at this one, it's not totally round, it's oval, so that when you uh, tighten it down, it doesn't want to come off. And if it does, there's a possibility of it messing up the threads on your pinion. And this one as well, it doesn't have that, that kind of big lip that sticks up, but you can see that it's, it's not even oval, it's got like a triangle shape almost. And that's what's going to lock it on there. So you do not want to be installing this over and over and over again because you will mess up your pinion threads. Trust me, I've done it before. So in the past, what I've done is this is one for a Dana 44 or an 88 that I think I believe they're the same nut. Uh, but I cut off the swedge part just with a cutoff wheel. And I've used this one to assemble probably three 88s using just this one nut. And I haven't had any problems. Use a ton of lube when you're doing your assembly. And then when you get to your final assembly, you can use that final nut with the swedge and your red Loctite. But in this case, these don't fit on this one. So I have an old one that you can kind of look at it. The swedge is not quite so bad. So I'm going to use this old one and save this brand new one for final assembly. And again, making sure that you use a ton of lube, oil, grease, whatever you got. Just make sure you keep it lubed up so it doesn't uh, mess up the threads on here. I'm going to put a little bit of oil on this just so it's not dry. So we've got kind of half new, half old parts. I'm going to get it together and see what we got. So I don't know if this is making sense to you guys. So the original sim, shim was 0.066, right? So it was too loose, so we needed to take shims out. So I went all the way down to 0 0.041, right? And that was too tight. And it was actually pretty close, but it was still too tight. So if you wanted to kind of narrow it down, you could do half of what you did. So you subtract those two numbers. I got 0 0.025 is the difference. So I want to go half of what that is which is like 0 0.012, whatever, right? So you could try and shoot if you wanted to go in between those two, 0 0.053. So you can make your shims 0 0.053, and that would give you that difference. So I know just by feel, because I've done this a lot, that I'm pretty darn close. So I don't want to go half, because that's way too much. 0 0.012, 0 0.013, that's way too much. So I'm actually only, only going to go in small increments now. So right now I added the smallest shim. It is 0 0.0035, right? So now I'm at 0 0.0455. I'm going to put this in there and see what it feels like. It's going to loosen it up just a tiny bit uh, because you do want some preload on that bearing. You don't want it to be loosey-goosey. So just from experience, I know I don't want to half that, uh, but if it was way too tight, you're like, okay, this is way too tight, that's what I would do. Just half it and uh, go from there. But I'm going to add the smallest shim that I have because I think we're pretty close, actually. Again, it's still too tight. You know what I bet's going to happen is if I did the half like I said I was going to do, It'd probably be perfect. I'm going to leave it actually for right now because I want to check kind of my pinion depth. And it's a lot easier to check the pattern when you have preload on your bearings. 
And I have no frame of reference for these shims. Like I haven't messed with this yet and I just don't know. So I'm making this up. I got this thing in here. My pinion preload is too high. I know that, but it does help me when I'm checking my pattern because I don't have to put a load on it because the pinion bearings are doing it for me. So I know I do have to loosen that up, but that's not going to affect my pattern. So I want to know my pinion depth right now. And my, pr my backlash is too high as well. Don't really care. I'm just going for an initial check to see if I need to add shims, or take shims out on the races inside. I just want to see where I'm at. I can see with my pattern, my pinion is way too far away. It needs to be moved in a lot. It's like that on both sides. So it's barely touching on the top here. We want to touch it right in the middle. Okay, I got it torn back apart. I have multiple problems to fix. One starting with my pinion depth, which is going to be the shims underneath this race right here, which it has uh, this little spacer cup right here and actually came with two I'm not sure why they're exactly the same but if I have to take it out more than one time I'm going to destroy it because you have to hit it with a punch from the inside and there's no little notch in the housing to get your punch behind it so you don't mess up your shims <laughs> What I'm going to do is I'm going to make a shim out of, I have literally a whole box of these shims, like hundreds of these shims. So I made a shim that's exactly the point, what was it, 0 0.085, 0 0.0185, make it exactly the same. So if I have to take it out, I'm not going to destroy it. And I also need to add some shims to actually bring it in closer. So I'm going to go really extreme with this because it looks so far out. So I'm going to add 0 0.02 shim. Now on to our, our pinion preload shims, 0 0.05. 0 0.05, I'm going to go with that. I like that. I like that number. We will try that. So now we are going to assemble it again. Oil on this new bearing. So I got this all reassembled again. Pinion still a little bit too tight and the backlash is still too much because I took a shim out of this left side because it was too tight to slide in. Okay. I don't want to be fighting it, banging it in and out, and using a pry bar trying to get in and out every time. So you want to get it just barely tight enough that it goes in and it has no slop in it, but it's not going to fight you when it's coming out. We are going in the right direction. It's getting super close. Sideways. That's actually looking pretty good right there. For our pattern, we can consult our guide here, our instruction book booklet. So, and also we have to remember that because it's a high pinion, the drive side is the coast side and the coast side is the drive side and this is kind of where I'm at here you can see how it's flat on the top and it kind of floats down that means that the pinion is a little bit too far away still when you put a shim behind that pinion you're gonna move that pinion closer and it's gonna change your preload shims because now there's more of a gap there and you are have to fill that up so if you put 0 0.02 shim behind the race here, 0 0.02 shim behind, add to your preload. And that way it will stay exactly the same all the way through. Okay. Let's get on that side. Let's check out the drive side. Drive side looks good. I need to take these out and set them aside because I don't need them anymore. Oh, stay there. 
and actually install this guy behind the race. So once I do that, that should be final. So for now, I'm just gonna put this, make sure that I put it in the correct way. I was hitting it on that side and it goes like that. So we will put it in like this. With all those shims. So it should equal the exact same as it did before and not change at all. <laughs> getting kind of warm in here. Matt dropped off his yoke that's not actually broken so I can start using that. So I got this in here, it feels really good. Consult our manual. So Dana 30 is 12 to 15 inch pounds of resistance. And we are there, we are, it's exactly 12. Before I did this, it was like 30 inch pounds which is more than double what we wanted. And I put in the smallest shim we had and it basically dropped it down from 30 to 12. So that tells you how much of a change just the smallest little shim makes once you get it within range. But I'm happy with this one at 12, it's perfect. This pinion final assembly, I'm gonna clean up where the seal rides. I'm gonna have a new seal so I'm gonna double check to make sure the yoke actually slides in there. Okay, perfect. Get it installed in there in the back here. Make sure you put some oil on here and on the lip of the O-ring as well. Liquid pipe sealer. Paint the inside of this. Permatex thread sealant with PTFE. It's like eight or nine bucks at the auto parts store. And make sure you clean up your pinion threads with a brake clean. And I use just by hand this wire brush to clean it all off. You're gonna be Loctiting in this new nut. So I have the new nut right here, brand new. Red Loctite. That's that's the rest of it. Slide the pinion on. The yoke on the pinion. Put our new nut on. Pin it down with your impact as tight as you can get it. Okay, so according to the instructions here, they want all of the shims inside the seal housing, which is right here. You see I have two shims in here right here because I already have my backlash. I have everything already set up, but I'm in, coming into a problem with the seal housing because here's my master shim, which this, they say has to be against the bearing, otherwise it'll cause failure. So I did mention earlier, I probably edited it out, but that I prefer to run the bigger shim on the outside so that it doesn't mess up these smaller shims when you're trying to install it. This is saying that you have to install this master shim up against the bearing, otherwise it'll cause failure. So I'm gonna go with what they're saying just because why not? And so I'll put the master shim on both sides up against the bearing, but I'll take my biggest shim that I got here. This is for the other side. The biggest shim that I got on the outside. So that way when I'm sliding it into the actual housing, this outer one has a tendency to catch on the lip of the housing and bend these shims if you're not super careful. So if you run these little tiny guys right here on the outside, they're gonna kind of flop around and they're gonna get bent and they're just gonna struggle with them and they will get destroyed, I pretty much promise you. So I'll run it like this with the master shim up against the bearing and the thickest shim that I have on the outer part of it to still be within what they want. The seal housing, when installed with all of the shims where they want it, I don't like it because it sticks out here. You can see, I can actually see the seal right here. 
this upper seal because there's two seals inside of here and a hole in between them that puts the air in. So I'll show you that in a second. But I don't like that. This should be sitting down a lot farther. So I actually contacted Yukon or Randy's and they're like, oh yeah, they knew exactly what we were talking about. And so they say run the master shim here and then run these all your other shims on the outside like this. So that will work and that will be fine, which is what I was going to do originally, but I just wanted to make sure that's the way they want you to do it and that's an acceptable way to do it. So the way this sits down now, the seal housing sticks up above this carrier just a little bit still, but the seal is actually not showing anymore and it's gonna seal a lot better. There's our hole where the air goes into the carrier. And we got our seals here, inner and outer, and our hole that the air comes through and pushes air in in between these two seals and pushes air into the housing right here. So that's how that works. Gotta check the backlash so you want to get it as far out on the tooth as possible in order to get a good reading only problem with mine is I've dropped this thing a bunch of times so it doesn't really sit doesn't tighten down very well so we're at eight so it's six to eight so we're good on that what we're gonna do is just want to be super careful I want to figure out if I can bend this a little bit I'm gonna to have to notch out these shims so in order to get that little bit of a notch in here in these shims I'm gonna set it up in this vise so I know the shims are together and not gonna flop around I'm just gonna use my carbide bit so just kind of at an angle and you don't want to cut all the way through so be super careful look how nice that turned out just got that notch right there it's going to go right on here and now we got perfect amount of clearance I can actually uh, bend this a little bit more so it is going to be make it a little bit more difficult to install this because everything's have, going to have to be perfect when it goes in I'm not really a fan of this gap right here it's touching I'm going to just take a tiny little bit off of this guy right here it's in this spot right here I'll take a little bit off and make myself feel a little bit better about the clearance. The next step is drilling out this housing. Should be fairly simple to drill through, but with this truss on here, it kind of limits my spots to uh, where to put it. And there's one spot right here, right here, that is thinner than everywhere else. So I've chosen to do it right there because I don't really have a choice. The only location I can do it, can't do it here, can't do it here, 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 or anywhere over here because the truss is in the way. I'm just gonna use my micrometer and put it up under here and I can look and see and feel where this area is. And it's right there and that's pretty much as deep as I can get it. This is drilled out to 7 16 and then we're using our quarter inch by 18 pipe tap uh, to tap this hole out. When you're doing this, you want to make sure you put some uh, grease on there or like I just threw anti-seize on there because it'll collect a lot of the metal shavings in between the, uh, in the, hole, in the sides of the tap here. And after a couple turns, I always go back a little bit to free it up. Flings out some of the, uh, the metal out of there that's binding up, and then you can keep going. The 
This is from my bearing kit, bearing installer kit. You can see I've used this for inner axle seals a lot. It fits over here like this and just kind of tap on the inside of it with this so it makes it go in straight. There we go, that one's in and we'll lube it up so it's not dry when they put this axle shaft in. A couple things really quick before I do final assembly. When I was setting it up uh, before, this shim got messed up and I can't fix it. I got a brand new one laying around so I'm going to replace it with that. And also when we go in we're going to be routing that hose up into here at the same time. It's going to be kind of a pain. It's going to be a juggling act. Uh, to try and not mess it up. So it's going to take a little bit of time to kind of get everything in there. And another tip is when you're setting up this carrier, you get everything all set up the way you want it. it slides in and out, but then you have to put preload on those bearings. So all you got to do is take the smallest shim you got, whatever, one of these little guys, and put the same one on each side. So you just throw this little one on the inside of this one and then another one on the inside of the other one. So it won't change your backlash, it won't move anything around, but it'll just make it tighter. So in carrier bearings, you can make them as tight as you want. They are not gonna fail due to being too tight. You just can't get them too tight. It's physically, it's pretty much impossible. I've never had any carrier bearings fail because they were too tight, but they can if it's too loose. Right now, I guess I'm gonna measure this because I, I don't wanna fiddle with this long tube anymore. So now that I have this set up where I want it, the routing kind of where I want it, it says about a half an inch above the bulkhead fitting, you wanna cut this off. So I'm at half an inch here and we will just kind of mark it here. And the way this works is this comes in from the bottom and this goes all the way in. They actually came over and took all of the nylon, the, the tubing, so they could plumb the whole car. So now they're gonna have to set part of this up and actually set this in because I can't do it and I don't have any tube left over. So basically this is gonna be, tube's gonna be inside here pretty much all the way to the top and your nylon plastic tube is gonna slide over top of it and then lock into this. So in between here, there's going to be an O-ring as well. This guy, it's going to slide over this, down into this housing, and then this will thread on to here. And I'll let Nate and Matt decide once they get here, once it gets over there, like they might need to cut a little bit more off of here in order for it to work. but. I don't think they will have to. It's going to be fine the way it is. Once you get your shim situation figured out and you got it in, uh, you're going to want to just gently bend this around utilizing the, you know, the notch in the shim, the notch in this thing here. You're going to kind of have to move it around a little bit. It's going to take a little bit of time to get everything lined up where you want it. Sit this down so we can... Torque these caps to 60. Okay, so we are looking good on our pattern still. Measuring the backlash one last time, making sure it's still within specification. Six to 10, and it looks like it is seven. So, perfect. Thanks guys for watching the video. I hope you learned a lot from, from it. Um, this 
setup with the air locker is probably not for a first timer beginner if you want to do it yourself man go for it uh jump in there go real slow uh make sure you get everything correct according to the book watch videos like this one read manuals make sure you're torquing everything properly and all everything's within spec before you move on to the next step because you're gonna bite yourself in the long run if you don't do it correctly all the way through um, this setup is particularly difficult because of the the airlines and the, sh the way the shims and everything is set up on the carrier is not the same as most uh, axles are set up and drilling the housing tapping in all that stuff it's not super hard but it's just a bunch of extra steps that you got to do that's not on a normal axle setup so this this setup is going to be great for Matt it's going to be an awesome upgrade for him make sure you go over to Nate's channel Dirt Lifestyle watch the first video if you haven't already to watch the Arctech Truss and the third video which will be after this one uh, where he's going to be doing WJ knuckle swap putting the axles in doing steering all kinds of cool stuff that's going to make this the ultimate day in the 30 axle as always guys make sure you subscribe to our channel hit that like button leave some comments and uh, we'll see you next time